Suzanne takes you down to her place near the river. So the idea of regenerative economics is to simply look to all living systems and understand this regenerative process and how it defines them and the common patterns and principles that define them that exist across all living systems. And then the hypothesis is very simple. If those living systems are models that have sustained themselves for very long periods of time, which by definition is, is true, or we wouldn't be able to study them, they're still here, then why wouldn't the patterns and principles that describe those need to be the same patterns that describe how the human economy works, if it's to sustain itself? And when you look at the human economy and contrast it with living systems, you see immediately things that are out of line. That was John Fullerton, our guest for today's podcast. And you want to travel with her, and you want to travel blind, and you know that she will trust you. Welcome to the Sue Speaks podcast, searching for unity in everything. I'm your host, Suzanne Taylor. How can we turn the world around? Can we turn the world around? That's what I talk to my thought-shaping guests about. In fact, everything I've done has been in pursuit of the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, buoyed up by that famous quote by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. John Fullerton is an important person. As an escapee from Wall Street, where he was the managing director of J.P. Morgan, He's asking the big questions by a Capital Institute, quote, his collaborative, working to illuminate how our economy and financial system can operate to promote a more just, regenerative, and thus sustainable way of living on this earth, unquote. This is a huge endeavor, a sea change in our conceptual framework for capitalism. He's no longer looking to improve investors' bottom lines as the be-all, end-all of what people should do with their money. But as his bio says, he is searching for a path that will lead us beyond our current unsustainable economic system and the finance-dominated ideology that drives it. The change in the economic model he is looking to instigate is as big as when we went from believing the world was flat. I'm not in the financial world, so I can't speak authoritatively to just how unusual it is to find someone who is so significant in it, who understands the ancient wisdom traditions, where we are of the living earth and not existing on it to use it. And we'll talk to him about the lay of the financial world these days, and if others who are as prominent in it are as enlightened as he is, about the need for what he calls regenerative economics as an alternative conceptual framework for capitalism. But just one more thing to say is how pleasing it is to me that he's steeped in the understandings of a previous podcast guest, Brian Swim, from whom I get my worldview, and who we'll try to get on a future podcast with John, where the economist and the physicist can look at the world as mystics together, so they can even more deeply cement the fundamental understandings of the world we need to move into, aligning us with our scientific understanding of how the universe actually works as if we intended our economy to behave like a living system that sustains itself over long periods of time. Maybe we'll even get another of my podcast guests, Joel Solomon, whose book, The Clean Money Revolution, Reinventing Power, Purpose, and Capitalism, is dealing with how we are destroying the planet's ability to support life as we know it, and the radical change we need in the modern scheme of economics and finance that John says forms the root cause of our systemic crises. So John, as your main story, or as you say, quote, wisdom demands we source our future prosperity by harnessing the immense potential available if we align our economy with the patterns and principles of living systems. I want you to tell everyone what this regenerative economy that you're touting is all about. But since we're in the COVID world, let's start with your thoughts about that. You, you wrote this. In such times, countries such as the U.S. have a weapon at their disposal that's not been used since Lincoln financed the Civil War with greenbacks. Central banks with their own reserve currency 
have the ability to simply print money and spend it into circulation in accordance with modern monetary theory. Now, John, not being steeped in economic theory myself, with this sounding so sensible, is that what we're doing? And is there any other financial advice you have for what the government could be doing now? Well, Suzanne, you've unpacked an awful lot there in a, in a wonderful introduction. So thank you for that. And thank you for inviting me on. I'm honored to follow in the footsteps of Brian Swim, whose book he wrote with Mary Evelyn Tucker, who's a close friend of mine, Journey to the Universe, uh, really touched me and spoke to me because it really expanded this idea that I've been wrestling with to extend beyond even humanity and even the, the planet Earth, but to the entire cosmos. It's really extraordinary that there does seem to be these patterns and relationships that extend from the, the very small to the very, very vast. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you. The economic system design itself, as I've tried to express in my writings and in my talks, is in irreconcilable conflict with the physical reality of a finite planet. You know, we have an economic system that's predicated on exponential growth, meaning growing more every year and therefore exponentially growing. And, you know, one thing the COVID crisis has taught all of us is the power of the exponential function. And that's happening just in slow motion with our economy, where it's gradually but increasingly every year taking over the fundamental functionality of the biosphere. And, um, and that can't go on forever. And in fact, there's all kinds of symptoms that it's in the process of collapsing, climate change being the one, the most noteworthy of many other symptoms. But at the same time, we have this need to now not only respond to the economic crisis caused by COVID, obviously there's the health crisis that is a topic maybe for another day, but with that health crisis comes an economic crisis, and that has required that the federal government in the United States has essentially resorted to, again, printing money, to put it in stark, blunt terms, similar to what happened during the Great Recession. But on top of that, we have another or equally profound crisis, even if less urgent, which is that we need to invest trillions of dollars in the, in particular, in the energy system transition, in the built environment, you know, greening the built environment, and to transform our agricultural system. And we need to do all of this in a relatively short period of time, meaning call it a decade or two. And that requires a level of investment capital that, in my opinion, the private sector on its own will simply not, it will not happen in time. And so there is this opportunity for the government to marshal this tool, which is its ability to create money for the very productive purpose of, for example, transforming our energy system, and probably for participating in transformation of the energy system, not just in the United States, but around the world, uh, particularly in countries that have no financial capacity to take on such a task. And this is a long, complicated conversation about money. I think the key insight, the people, Stephanie Kelton and, and Randall Ray and others who have developed this idea of modern monetary theory over the last two decades, the key insight they raise is that the federal government that prints U.S. dollars that has a base currency, particularly the reserve currency of the world, is different than you and I. We have a household budget, we need to balance our budget or we go bankrupt. Same for any private corporation. Eventually, if it doesn't make money, it goes bankrupt. Well, the United States doesn't go bankrupt. The United States can simply create more money to pay off its debts. And in fact, that's what it has been doing and it does do and can continue to do on a scale that is hard to comprehend. And I would be the first to say that there are limits to that. But when there's such an urgent need as keeping people employed and in the midst of a depression, or in the urgent need to transition the energy system away from fossil fuels, we need to give up this idea that we need to balance the budget or pretend that we need to balance the budget and actually do what we know we need to do in order to avoid a much, a much larger problem. Well, to what extent are we actually doing that? What's the difference between your ideal situation and what we're actually doing? Well, it's a, it's a great point. You know, before COVID hit, we would have had a debate in this country about how much of a deficit we could create with our borrowing 
to do whatever it is we choose to do as our priorities. And of course, the current administration chose to cut taxes for corporations and wealthy individuals and blew a hole in the budget. And, you know, there weren't any deficit hawks to say we can't do that. And it turns out it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt us much at all. It made, made us more unequal, but it didn't create a, uh, you know, bout of inflation or all the things that the deficit hawks would have suggested would happen. And now that we're in the middle of this COVID crisis, we're running the experiment in real time. And in fact, we are running up, I think we've, we've reached a trillion dollar deficit this year alone. And the central bank's balance sheet is expanding. So the central bank is essentially monetizing this increased debt. And we're proving that this is a viable tool in a real time experiment. The thing I would want to see happen differently is rather than the central bank simply buying bonds in the, in the capital markets to support the capital markets, you know, think of it as Instead of buying mortgage bonds that keep the financing costs for housing low, we need them to be buying the loans and bonds that are being used to finance the transition to renewable energy on a scale that is measured in trillions. Um, you know, the, the experts have said we need to invest $2 trillion a year for the next 20 years to finance the energy transition off fossil fuels and onto renewables. And so some role for the, you know, the, the largest government financing vehicle in the world, which is the U.S. Central Bank, there needs to be a role for that. And it may not be as simple as just buying bonds. It may be financing new development banks, creating the equity that then those development banks can do the project finance we need done. It's a bit more complicated than simply buying bonds. But the point is we need to let go of this idea that, boy, we have a deficit and we need to balance the budget when we have a literally life or death for the face of humanity issue facing us right in the face. And if we don't deal with that, whether we have inflation or not won't matter because we will have much bigger problems to deal with. So just as we decided when COVID hit that we needed to finance unemployment in an unprecedented way, I would argue we need to finance the energy transition and the agriculture transition and the transition of our transportation systems and our built environment, you know, the, the, the buildings, uh, making them more energy efficient. All of that is of equal urgency. It's just happening on a slower pace. And so we don't see it as, as urgent. But it, in the scheme of the long run, it's absolutely urgent. In fact, we're, we're decades late and we better catch up. Well, is this a place where you should tell the listeners about this regenerative idea that is the fundamental principle that you're working on? And I'm still not certain, like, if we get Biden or a Democratic president, will they be on the side of what you're talking about? Mm. Or is it going to still be a, a struggle? So the answer is this, is, this sits above the kind of political, conservative, Republican ideas versus liberal, Democratic ideas. It's totally apart from the current environment of politics, which is this very divisive, you know, Trumpism versus non-Trumpism. You know, the, the truth is that our communist economic system, our socialist economic systems, and our capitalist economic system all build their path to prosperity on the idea of exponential growth. And so, unfortunately, all of them are equally flawed. All of them, we could debate for the last hundred years about which one creates more prosperity for humanity, which one's fair, which one's good, which one's bad. But all of them source their prosperity through the continuous, and, and this is critical, exponential increase in the extraction of natural resources from the planet, perhaps the extraction of human resources from our humanity, depending on your ideology. But irrespective of the human aspect, it is the continual expansion of the, what, what the technical term people use is ecological footprint of the economy on this planet. And unfortunately, the planet's not growing. So, you know, the, it's easier to see this with the fisheries or with a forest. You know, you can cut down 10 trees out of a forest and it doesn't matter. You can cut down 100 trees from a big forest and it doesn't matter. But at some point, you cut down a few more trees and you don't have a forest. And so the, the plan to cut down some trees to burn for firewood is a great plan when you have massive forests and a very small population. But eventually that plan is simply not viable. And that's a you know, same thing with the fisheries. 
And unfortunately, that's a metaphor for our entire economic system, which has a footprint or a, it has a throughput of materials and energy coming into the system and getting put out of the system as waste. And the one that's really, you know, in the news and now in our, in our face every day with climate change is the waste stream, which we call uh, CO2 emissions. And, and the atmosphere has filled up with our waste and can't handle any more, any more than a river that gets totally polluted can take any more pollution. So it doesn't matter what your political beliefs are, what your ideology is. This is physics. This is good old fashioned physics. And unfortunately, therefore, it's not about what Biden thinks or what Trump thinks or what any politician thinks, because from my vantage point, they're all still trapped, even the Green New Deal, which is much closer to my thinking, uh, not because it's socialist, but because it has the right priorities, but it's still trapped in this false idea that we can grow ourselves to prosperity. The idea of a regenerative economy is, you know, regeneration is a process. We're having this conversation because your body and my body are living systems and they stay alive because they regenerate themselves. Literally, physically, at a cellular level, we're in constant regeneration. That turns out to be true, not just for our bodies, but for any living system, big or small, from tiny little bugs to entire ecosystems like the Amazon forest. And it turns out, Brian Swim would tell you, that it's true at a cosmic level, although I couldn't explain that or defend that. But this idea of this regenerative process, it's almost like a continual motion machine where we expand, we create more abundance from the abundance we have. But it doesn't mean it gets physically bigger. It means we have more abundance. So, you know, take your body again, your body, my body, anybody's body. You know, we grow exponentially through our childhood and into adolescence. But then hopefully we begin to develop in a non-physical way. We develop intellectually, we develop spiritually, we develop our interests, our creativity, but our physical bodies stop growing at some point. But that doesn't mean our potential stops when our physical bodies stop. So the idea of regenerative economics is to simply look to all living systems and understand this regenerative process and how it defines them and the common patterns and principles that define them that exist across all living systems. And then the hypothesis is very simple. If those living systems are models that have sustained themselves for very long periods of time, which by definition is, is true or we wouldn't be able to study them, they're still here, then why wouldn't the patterns and principles that describe those need to be the same patterns that describe how the human economy works, if it's to sustain itself. And when you look at the human economy and contrast it with living systems, you see immediately things that are out of line. And of course, they're, nothing, they're not brilliant insights. They're things that are very obvious. You know, a living system is a metabolism. It needs a source of food and it needs to deposit its waste in a way that has a uh, circulation, like a metabolism. If we spoil our nest, we can't live in our homes. Well, the human economy is actually in conflict with that principle, the principle I call robust circulation. So if we're in conflict with a core principle, it stands to reason that the system is unsustainable. And if you look across, I've defined eight principles. The point isn't what my definition is. The point is these are living systems principles. And if you look across all eight of the ones I've articulated, you'll see that our human economy is in conflict literally with each and every one of them. And it's in conflict with them, not because bad people designed this system. It's because we were ignorant because of our reductionist mindset. We were ignorant of the idea that the human economy needed to behave the way a living system did. So we designed it the way we think an efficient machine would work. And like many pursuits of efficiency, there's a unintended consequence of a loss of resiliency. And that loss of resiliency in a simple way is, is what we're struggling with right now on a global scale. That um, brings permaculture to mind. Permaculture is the foundation of a regenerative uh, living system applied to human, human needs. And so, you know, there is no healthy human economy without a healthy agriculture system as its foundation, both because we need to build soil, not destroy soil, and our human economy destroys soil, and because of the abundance. The abundance in our gardens is a beautiful metaphor for the abundance that's possible if we align 
the patterns and principles of the economy with the way living systems actually work, just as it does in permaculture. Well, this is such a huge concept you're working with. I mean, here we are running on the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer and uh, self-interest running the show as opposed mm -hmm. to mutuality or humanitarian basis for living instead of an economic basis. I mean, these, this is a huge shift mm -hmm. that we're up against. How are we doing in is this conversation being had in a significant way? I mean, you're so steeped in that world, you'd know better than you know most about what the prospects are for it and how, how much listening there is for it, how much understanding there is for it. Mm. Talk about that some. Yeah, I wish I, wish I had a, um, <laughs> a more optimistic answer. I, I, I would say that the good news is that I've been on this search for now about 20 years. The first five of them, I was completely ignorant and lost. The next five, I was befuddled and trying to find my way. And the last 10, I would say I was, I was on the hunt, if you will, and began to lock into this idea of, of living systems, which again, is not my idea. This is, this is lots of, of really thoughtful people, frankly, going all the way back to Aristotle, but certainly Goethe. And, you know, it's, it's really a shift from the modern age reductionist mindset to what some people call the integral age or holistic thinking. And its application is in virtually across every domain of knowledge from agriculture in particular, but also medicine, uh, governance, and you know, my, my shtick, if you will, or my, my forte is economics and finance. But this is a transformation that is happening for sure. I have zero doubt. It's happening across all fields of knowledge it is going to profoundly revolutionize our understanding across all fields of knowledge and reconnect it with what we've understood forever, which is the indigenous wisdom. You know, it, it, what amazes me is that this is both in alignment with our latest scientific understanding of how the universe and the planet work, and it's aligned with our indigenous wisdom, the only human culture that has actually stood the test of time. So, you know, on one simple level, we could say we're simply going back to what we always knew and have forgotten. But it's not going back because it's integrating all our modern scientific understanding at the same time. So it's not an either or. It's a, it's a, it's a vast increase in complexity of our, of our understanding of, of, of how, who we are and how we exist in this, on this planet. But to answer your question specifically, you know, one of the seminal books that I read that really was sort of an epiphany and a, as Ray Anderson used to say, a, a spear in the chest moment was the, uh, the infamous now study Limits to Growth. It was co-authored by four MIT students in the complexity science department at MIT. Uh, the lead author, Dana Meadows. So, you know, you, going back to your, your original question, how is this being received or understood on the, you know, call it in mainstream finance and business? And you know, when I first read Limits to Growth was this seminal book written in the 70s about this conflict between exponential growth and a finite planet. Of course, Limits to Growth uh, was a club of Rome. It was a report to the Club of Rome and it was laughed at at the time. Um, in fact, most people still believe that it's sort of a neo-Malthusian sky is falling uh, document. In fact, I would suspect most people in big leadership positions in mainstream business and finance either have never read it or don't even know what it says. Or if they are aware of it, it came into their consciousness and they've dismissed it as not true. And of course, there's been study after study as recently as several years ago that essentially showed that even though their models were prehistoric by current complexity model standard, they're pretty much spot on accurate and the world is playing out just as they alerted us to if we kept business as usual. So my point is, when I first read that, probably in around 2004, after I kind of picked myself up off the floor, I felt that this would be kind of easy. I now have read this. I understand it. It's obvious. It's this common sense obvious. And my job is to go bring this message, like Paul Revere, to the captains of industry so that they understood it because they're too busy to read the book because I've now created space for myself to read the book. And once we get all these guys, and it's mostly guys together, we'll figure out what we're going to do about it. And that was 2005, maybe. 
And um, here I am. The truth is that what I've learned is that we don't change our religion and we don't change our worldviews very easily. And when your worldview is built on a foundation that exponential growth is the source of prosperity and you're the winner because you sit on the top of whatever bank or whatever company or president of the United States that's built on that foundation, it's very difficult for you to fundamentally challenge it because it's like losing your identity. In fact, I think this is probably why I left Wall Street. I had this need to lose my identity rather than a desire to defend my identity. And I don't know why that is, but it, became, it was simple for me, as simple as just you know, taking off a shirt and trying on a new shirt. But what I've learned since then is that our biggest challenge right now is that the powers that be are, are so trapped in that identity, they literally can't see it. It's not that they see it and reject it logically. I believe they literally can't see it. It's beyond their ability to imagine. And so again, quoting Dana Meadows, our biggest fear or our biggest risk is our lack of imagination. And is it possible to have a more prosperous world without exponential growth on the finite planet? I believe there is because I've seen it through my own investment projects where we un unlock this regenerative potential. Regenerative potential is very real. Just to give one simple example, uh, one of the principles I talk about is right relationship. Uh, everything is in symbiotic right relationship. Right relationship is a Quaker term that my colleague Peter Brown uh, used for a title of a book. And, and so I stole that from Peter with his blessing. And in living systems, every part works symbiotically together. So there's all these win-win relationships. And the most fundamental one for life is the relationship between hydrogen and oxygen. H2O is a relationship of molecules that unlocks the potential of all life. So imagine sitting in a world where there were just molecules of hydrogen and oxygen sitting around and no one thought of the idea of combining them together. There would be no way to imagine what life would be like. But when they're in right relationship, we create water, which creates the potential for all life. So it's, it's so far beyond what we can see at that basic fundamental level. Another right relationship is a relationship between our planet Earth and our sun. If we were 10% further apart or 10% close together, we're not having this conversation on Zoom. I'm convinced, and I've seen it again in, in, in numerous of my investment projects, where there is potential everywhere that we don't see. And it's tapping that potential, which is, I believe, the source of our future prosperity and what gives me reason for hope. Whereas the hope of being able to cut down a few more trees out of a forest that's denuded is pretty hopeless. And that's essentially the path we're on. And again, to repeat, whether we're Democrats or conservatives or the, we are Trump supporters or hate the guy, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with basic physics. You know, everything that you say is so consistent, consonant with my understanding. It's getting us back to what's natural and where we are of the earth, not on it to use it. And to me, it's very promising that you coming from that hardcore financial world are so steeped in this very enlightened understanding. Let me say that differently because okay. you said it very politely because you're a polite, wise elder, let me say. But the truth is that what you meant, I suspect, is that you know, how refreshing that one of you dumb, arrogant men know everything and think you run the world have finally woken up to what we uh, feminine elders have understood forever and no one's listening to us, right? I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I happen to agree with you. And one of the principles, again, is in balance. And probably the most fundamental thing humanity needs to get back into balance is the balance of the masculine and the feminine. And from my study and my understanding of that, the feminine is actually the dominant of those two. They need to be in balance. It doesn't mean one's better than the other, but just like resiliency is the dominant trait between resiliency and efficiency, the divine feminine to me is the higher wisdom. And of course, that's true in indigenous cultures. And of course, that's exactly the opposite of the way we've constructed human culture. 
You know, one of the things that I picked up somewhere from what you had written or said is we need to go from problem solving to holistic design. I like that so much that, you know, so many ways to capture this dichotomy or this opposition or the difference between where we are and where we need to go. But, you know, here we are, we attack these problems piecemeal, try to fix try to fix that without going to the underlying cause that really supports all the problems, which would be holistic design rather than problem solving uh, Mm -hmm. on top of a system that's not the proper system to really uh, in us and uh, what have you. You know, one of the things as you were talking also occurred to me to say was, you know, it's such a complicated world and everything is really fixed the way it is in very complex relationships. And the power structure uh, wants to retain it that way because it's to their advantage. And one of the things that I have said and think about is that's kind of the rationale for why psychedelics are illegal and alcohol is legal. But psychedelics makes you change your worldview. So... Mm -hmm. I always thought, oh, that's one of those things you could point to. If I can say one thing on what you just said, and I I certainly agree with it, I would say it slightly different. I think the reason that we're so locked rigidly in place is it's not just that those in positions of power don't want to change. It's not as rational as that. It's not like, oh, okay, let me think about it. So if I If I change my worldview, then I have to give up my position of power, and that's not in my interest, so I'm not going to do that. I actually think that's certainly true in many cases, but I think in many other cases, it's a literal cognitive inability to see that my worldview might be flawed and might be untrue. I believe that the more, quote, successful one is, and frankly, the more masculine, successful, competitive, conquer one is, which of course defines the heroes of capitalism, whether they're hedge fund traders or, you know, captains of industry, the least able they are to actually see a different worldview. So, you know, my success rate at convincing, I'll just refer to a billionaire as a pejorative term, which I think is unfair, but but if you've made a billion dollars through your hard work, ingenuity, and grit, and talent, you're pretty confident. And it's that confidence that is unshakable when it comes to questioning a worldview. So maybe had I been more successful on Wall Street, I wouldn't have been able to shed that worldview as effectively. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I think you were tapped. You know, some of us are. We just get it, you know? There you are, and fortunately, you are you're a getted in the middle of the ghetto or whatever. Uh, well, let me ask you. Let me ask you about an idea of mine uh, that I don't hear talked about because I always think about how can we change the whole thing, you know, and then not take this, that, and the other and try to fix them until we fix what's causing all of them or mm. all of them. So one of the thoughts I have, I think about Maslow's hierarchy and that uh, until you handle your basic needs, you really can't see anything but that. And that I think, well, let's see, if I were the emperor of the world, I think what I would do is I would do universal basic income for everybody in the world, bring everybody in the world up to where they get education, they get food, they get shelter, they get health care, and not you know, make everybody rich, but get rid of this incredible stretch between the rich and the poor where mm. so small percentage of the world can, you know, holds all the wealth. Wouldn't that end war if everybody was sustained? Mm. And then make your whole war budget to do that. Maybe it's too simplistic. Like that work? You know, when you have a hammer, you everything looks like a nail, right? So I my hammer is now these eight principles of regenerative economics. So So rather than give you my opinion, which I do have a strong opinion on, and you won't be shocked that I'm in agreement with you. But forget my opinion. Let's look to see what the living systems principles tell us the answer is. And they are derived from a a lot of study of living systems, and they've been tested with living system scientists, experts who really understand living systems much better than I do. And and they've broadly gotten the check. You know, they're, they're good enough. Let's test my hypothesis. My hypothesis is that if the human economy is going to be sustainable and thrive, 
it needs to be aligned with these principles. So let's just look at one of them, and we could go through all eight of them, but one of them in particular stands out to address this issue. The principle, in, again, in my language, is empowered participation. And what that means is that all parts of the system need to be empowered to participate in the system in order for the system to be healthy. So again, using our bodies as a quick analogy, our toes and our feet are empowered to participate in the circulation of oxygen. Not because my poor little toes, I feel sorry for them, I want them to be happy, but because if my toes and my feet don't participate in the circulation of oxygen, I can't be healthy as a system. I can't walk, I can't fulfill my potential, I can't stay fit. So not only is it bad for my feet if they don't get oxygen, but it's bad for me and my potential is reduced. Whereas if my feet participate in the health of my system, they can actually contribute to my potential. I can run a marathon. So what does that say about the extreme poverty and the ability to do a guarantee, you know, like you say, a guaranteed minimum income is a beautiful metaphor for, or, or actual practical policy solution to ensuring the empowered participation of all parts of the human economy. And so, ta-da, perfect fit. So we need to do it. Well, how are we gonna pay for it? Well, modern monetary theory is sitting there on the shelf. Um, so we don't need to pretend we can't do it. And we can debate how much and blah, 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 but we can't pretend that we can't do it. It's a harder challenge when you're dealing with, say, for example, um, Peru or you know, Bangladesh, where their central bank's limitations are different than ours. But starting with the United States, there's no question in my mind that we could finance a guaranteed minimum income and that that would make a huge difference in our ability to shift toward a regenerative economy, as well as alleviate a lot of pain and suffering, which of course, as a human being, I'm in favor of. But even if I didn't care about pain and suffering, but only I believed in the wisdom of living systems principles and patterns, it would tell me we need to do that, not for their sake, quote unquote, but for all of our sake and, and for the potential of the entire human society. Well, John, talk to me about billionaires. That makes perfect sense. What you're saying, everything you say makes perfect sense. I don't get billionaires. Nobody needs a billion dollars. <laughs> you know, not to mention that during COVID, uh, the richest people in the world, like Jeff Bezos, has increased his wealth by $70 billion, as have many of the others profiting on COVID. I mean, yeah. this Bernie proposal that we've just gotten that, 60% of their excess profits should go back to the people. In fact, he's suggesting that that would pay for health care for underinsured, uninsured people, which, mm. I, and I think, well, why 60%? Why not all of it? I mean, it's a great question. Like anything, there are at least two sides of the story. Let's start with what would living systems principles tell us? And the principle of imbalance and in right relationship and empowered participation and robust circulation. You know, if all this wealth is tied up in the, you know, holdings of 100 families, it's in violation of the principle of robust circulation. It's like a clogged artery. So, again, I can love billionaires or I can hate billionaires. I can think it's fair. I can think it's completely unjust. What do the living systems principles tell us? They tell us that it's out of balance. And what's the right balance? We can debate that. But, but for sure, if you've got you know, half the wealth clogged up in a you know, small little pocket and not circulating throughout the system, which is what it is, it appears to me, and we could, I'd be happy to debate this with someone, but it appears to me that it's in violent conflict with how healthy living systems work. So that's, that's where I start. How do we deal with it, both the psychology, the policy, and all that. So, so I am I'm a uh, privileged white man, and I'm a privileged COVID, whatever the right term is. So, so we just sold our house in a lovely suburb of Rye that pre-COVID would have been very difficult to sell. But now, because of COVID, everyone wants to get out of New York City. And it turns out if you have an old carriage house that you can use as a home office and a pool outside, you've got buyers. I sold my house in a week for more money than I would have expected by far than six months ago. And in fact, in the midst of March, when New York was melting down, 
and it felt like a depression that would never end, I assumed I'd never sell this house, at least for the next 10 years. So I'm a beneficiary on a different scale than Bezos, but I'm a beneficiary of, of COVID financially. And that makes no sense, right? I mean, I listened to the sirens in March outside my window every single night of all the healthcare workers um, taking people to the hospitals and dying. Like, you know, it was awful. And here I am, the last person on the world that deserves, you know, a, a financial gain, uh, am sitting on a big financial gain. Now, now Bezos's story is the same story. It's only add a few zeros. <laughs> and so it's, it's completely unfair. But none of that was designed into the system, right? No, no one said, how can we construct a disease that will benefit e-commerce so that Bezos will benefit more than anyone? I mean, it just, it's unfair. And so the question is, what do we do about it? And I have two ideas I'll share just today, just to kind of get our, our minds uh, going a little bit. The first one to me is a no-brainer, which is that this idea of uh, an estate tax needs to be revisited. It's one thing for a billionaire to have billions of dollars during his or her lifetime and do what they want and feel great and boy, they earned it and blah, 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 blah. But the last thing that should happen is that it all goes to their three kids or their one kid or their three kids and two dogs. And so it's, a re it's an easy time for a reset. And we should absolutely tighten up all of the tax policies and our, what we accept as a society that you know, there's some limit on how much you can give to your children. And let's debate that too. Is it a million dollars? Is it $10 million? Is it $100 million? Is it a billion dollars? Whatever. Set a number and that's it. You know, if I had to pick a number, it would be a number like 10 million, but it wouldn't be more than 50 million. It'd be in that range. You, know, you can't make a case in my mind that you know, poor Sally or poor Joey needs a billion dollars to be secure. That's one thing I would do. And then the second thing is there are different approaches to this, but I like the idea of pre-distribution of wealth rather than redistribution of wealth. Redistribution of wealth is, again, dealing with a problem. Pre-distribution of wealth is dealing with it at the root cause at the systemic level. Most of the extreme wealth, not all of it, but most of it comes from an entrepreneurial success, right? At least in our country. In, in other countries, it can come from lots of different sources that are less, less attractive. But, you know, whether it's Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or, you know, the, the founders of Google, whatever, it's from an entrepreneurial success. And there's no reason that, you know, people will say, well, you'll, you'll inhibit motivation and whatnot. That's ridiculous. If Bill Gates had $20 billion instead of $60 billion, he would be equally motivated. And so my idea on pre-distribution of wealth would be to invoke the idea, and actually Obama said this and got hammered for it, but anyone who builds a company today is building it on the back of the technologies that exist when they start. So if there's no internet, there's no Facebook. If there's no microchip, there's no Microsoft. If there's no social network, there's no Uber. And so in my mind, there ought to be, and this gets a, a little bit of sort of financial speak gobbledygook, but imagine if there were a commons portfolio, which we all owned, and every time a company is created, that entity would own, pick a number, 25% of the new business, but only, only once it reached a billion dollars in market cap. So... 99% of the businesses that get started never reach a billion dollars of market cap. So this wouldn't affect almost everybody. But for the few cases of the Googles or the Microsofts or the Facebooks, suddenly the public represented by this fund or this vehicle would own 25% of all of them. But that interest, that ownership interest would only kick in once they were wildly successful. Or maybe it's 50%. We can debate again what the number is. But what that would do is it would vastly flatten the, the, the extreme wealth and share that systematically with the entire society. And the logic of it is not just, oh, that would be a nice thing to do, but the logic of it is that the only way that Facebook or Google was possible is because of everything that came before it. Just like we all wake up and inherit the air we breathe. And so why wouldn't that be different than 
the technology that we breathe. And so in that way, it would be one attempt to systematically put a damper on this inequality, both on the top end, but on also you have the resources so we can reduce the dependency we have on printing money. You have the resources to actually share uh, across the economy because the innovation is gonna continue. There's gonna be another Google. There's gonna be another Facebook. I don't know what it is, but the wealth creation is gonna be even more concentrated once we get into the world of artificial intelligence. So we need to do this now. Let me go on and ask you this. Why is Wall Street, just a little practical question now for people who are interested in this sort of thing, why is Wall Street doing so well? And what a little investor like me, it scares me. I mean, I say, oh, it's okay, it's back. But then I think, how could it sustain? We're in such trouble. I just take all my money out and put it under my mattress. And, you know, what, what, what's your thoughts about that? Well, it makes no sense to me either. Trust me. I'm hesitant to say too much because I am no financial you know, prognosticator. And I, if I knew what was going to happen, I, you know, I don't. I don't think anyone does. But here's what I, I would say. One, the indices and the media that we get fed this are focused on a very few number of companies. I was just literally looking at this the other day. Apple, the company, has appreciated in its value. So it was high and then it collapsed with everything. And since that collapse in, I don't know, March-ish, whenever that was, it has now appreciated by something like $900 billion. I remember when Apple crossed the trillion dollar mark of value and it was like unheard of. And here in three months, it's rallied almost that same trillion. And so much of what we see in the broad market indices is a handful of companies like Apple and Microsoft and Amazon. It isn't really the barometer of the economy that the media makes us think it is. It's really this story of inequality playing out all over again with companies. And there are a handful of companies that are either by luck or genius or a little bit of both, like perfectly positioned for the future digital economy that is going to accelerate on us faster as a result of COVID than it was happening already, but it was happening already. So in a a sense, what Amazon did is it accelerated 10 years of differentiation overnight because retail went out of business and everything went to Amazon. Well, that trend was well underway for the last five years, 10 years, and was going to continue, but it just collapsed. And so the the impact of that was extraordinary. So it's kind of been an accelerator into this new world we're in. And it's accelerated the inequality. It's really not as crazy as it looks. It's just happening on an exponentially faster scale. But meantime, the oil and gas industry is almost bankrupt. And yet we don't see that and feel that and hear that in the news in part because the oil and gas industry was already in decline, and now it's just hastened its decline. So it's complicated. I would agree with your first premise that having said everything that I just said, it doesn't make any sense to me. The valuations in the stock market are, in my opinion, doesn't mean they won't go higher, but it makes no sense. My own approach to investing is to move money out of the stock market and try to find more nuanced ways to invest in a way that's aligned with my values and principles as opposed to speculating in the stock market. It's almost like there's no good, easy decision other than to be diversified and I would argue to be defensive and cautious as opposed to aggressive, you know, unless you're 25 and you're going to ride the cycle out. Putting it back into a bigger lens, we're living through a, an extraordinarily volatile time of humanity. And with that comes extreme volatility in economies. And with that comes extreme volatility in stock markets. And we just need to recognize that, you know, we're in a different phase than we were in 1950 when the war was behind us and it was sort of smooth sailing for miles and miles ahead. So I think we need to behave accordingly. And you know, there's no like golden rule that says you need to earn 9% on your 401k for every year until you're dead. Um, that just doesn't exist. And, and so we pretend as if that's sort of the base case. And what if the base case is, you know, returns will be volatile and, and average out to zero. 
well, then your mattress looks pretty good. Um, now, I don't know what the answer is, but I know, I'm, I feel very confident that it's not a blind, put your money in a passive mutual fund and you get to earn 9% without thinking about it. I just don't think that world exists right now. No, oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I just worry about the collapse being, you know, a real collapse where, yeah. where nothing works anymore and we go back to some primitive reality. But Yeah, and you know, and I, I spend a lot of time in that conversation with people. Well, first of all, I think we are in collapse. It's just not a single event like an earthquake. But think about, you know, my kids' generation. They were little kids on 9-11. Then there was the dot-com crash. Sorry, the dot-com crash was first. Then there was 9-11. Then there was the financial crash. Then there was God knows what, forest fires, hurricanes. Now there's COVID. Global warming hitting us in all different ways. The, the nuclear disaster in Japan. I mean, what more does it take to call it collapse? You know, if you want to get really depressed, you look at species extinction and the rate of extinction versus we've never seen anything like this since the dinosaurs went extinct. So we're in collapse. It's just sort of a slow motion. And, you know, whether the stock market is where it is today or half of what it is today is kind of a trivial, irrelevant detail in the context of the big story that's playing out at the beginning of this century. It's not an irrelevant detail to our 401k, but in the scheme of this change, it's really a, a relatively small piece. And I think we need to get our heads around how big this change is, but not be paranoid and petrified by it. Recognize it means, you know, the importance of home, the importance of family, the importance of community, and get clear on, you know, how and where we want to live and be resilient for whatever's going to come because no one can predict what's going to come. But I think it's fair to predict it's going to be volatile. And it has been for 20 years already in this century. We are in a very unhinged state, which one of the virtues of that is it really forces us to think again. Are there any particular people to uh, pay attention to that you pay attention to who, you know, we can tell the listeners, hey, pick up on so-and-so? So, you know, I've mentioned Stephanie Kelton and this idea of modern monetary theory. I think that's one piece of the, of the puzzle. There's a whole bunch of people now working on this idea of, of a new economy. Club of Rome has a, has a good initiative on that. Herman Daly is the creator of what's called ecological economics. But I've been part of a process to try to get him nominated for Nobel Prize. It hasn't gone anywhere, the economics Nobel. I was mad for him during the new age. Ecological economics was to me the big groundbreaking insight that exponential growth on a finite planet doesn't work for economics and scale matters. Of course, the Nobel Prize Committee for Economics, which is the Swedish Central Bank, it's not really a, a legitimate Nobel Prize. They awarded the Nobel Prize to um, uh, William Nordhaus a couple of years ago. And he's famous because he produced a, uh, a climate model that calculates, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you, it calculates that the optimal target for global warming we should shoot for is three and a half degrees Celsius. Not two degrees, not one and a half degrees, which is what the science tells you, but three and a half degrees. And the logic for that is that any lower target would cost too much in terms of lost economic growth. So here you have the Nobel Prize in economics awarded to a man whose model says we should shoot for three and a half degrees Celsius. Which is terrible. Which is the end of life as we know it on this planet. Oh my God. Oh, we are so crazy. Yeah, that's, that's the state of economics. In fairness, there are plenty of economics professors who think that's crazy and I don't know how it happened, but there had to be a lot of serious economists reviewing who was going to get the prize in 2018. Somehow that passed muster. My, well, I'll put it this way. My current interest is moving more and more into this study, this indigenous study, the study of the divine feminine. Um, I, I think we need to get above our logical analysis of the problem and move into a, a much deeper uh, sensing into the problem. So that's where my interest has gone. But there's plenty of brilliant intellectual minds wrestling with the economic system and climate problem. I'd be hesitant to mention them because of the ones that I would neglect to mention. If you go on my website, I've got a, a whole page of books that I've read that have been influential on me. 
Well, we'll post capitalinstitute.org on our page for you so that everybody can, you know, go more deeply into what you're talking about. But this seems like a good time to ask, to sum this up and ask you to tell us what I asked you to think about before about your own mission statement. Have you got one for me? It clearly has something to do with this idea of reconnecting and integrating the traditional wisdom that we've let go of together in with our modern scientific understanding of how, how the universe actually works and apply that insight to our economic system design and in particular into the financial system that powers the economic system. I spent 20 years on Wall Street, I believe now for a purpose, which was to learn how it works and to gain a credible voice in that arena, which is uh, not well understood by most people. And yet I know that it is a critical leverage point, if not the critical leverage point, or trim tab to use Bucky Fuller's term in, in steering the economy. And so the, the way financial capital flows is energy. It's the energy of modern society. And we need to redirect that energy in a way that is uh, aligned with indigenous wisdom. That's my task. I probably won't finish it before I'm done here, but I think this is a, a shift that's going to be measured in decades. I don't think it gets done anytime soon. John, this is not good news for your elder here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we sometimes overinflate our own self-importance on this planet. The civil rights movement you know, Martin Luther King kind of put a stake in it, but it was going on for decades before that. And, and I think we're in a similar stage of this transition. So now the other thing I asked you to think about, a one-line message to the world? So my one-line message to the world is to place your faith and retain hope in this idea of the regenerative potential that exists for sure even if we can't quite see it or talk about it. Right. Oh, John, golly, I want you to take over. <laughs> be president, you can be my president. I'll be, I'll be your vice president. Oh, I'll be the president. All right. There you go. I will definitely need you because you certainly understand a lot of things I don't understand. But I'm very glad that, you know, I've crossed paths with you because I'm coming to understand much more, really, thanks to how wise you are. So I really appreciate this uh, time together. And, you know, I hope that we've been clear enough that ordinary mortals can understand <laughs> what you're talking about. But, you know, have them write in and, you know, ask you questions. And yeah, I'd love to. I joke because the truth is people think what I say is complicated and, and on one level it is, but my gift is not intelligence, it is curiosity. And that I can tell you with great confidence. One of the things I talk about all the time, I remember when I got in the human potential movement and my parents didn't understand, you know, what I was up to. And I just kept saying, just be curious. That would be a fabulous quality if everybody uh, participated in it. Thank you so much for being so smart and for spending. This <laughs> being curious. And, and yeah, I'm being curious. And, you know, may, may you change the world. Well, you too, Suzanne. It's been wonderful having this conversation. I'm glad we finally made it happen. And I'd love to continue. As you said, it'd be, it'd be fun to, to, I've never met Brian. So maybe we have a, a physics and economics conversation as a, as a follow-on would be fun. This would be wonderful. I will look forward to that. So thanks a million. Now Suzanne takes your hand and she leads you to the river. So, dear listeners, thank you for tuning in to my Sue Speaks podcast. Do subscribe so you don't miss any episodes and visit suespeakspodcast.com for notes on what we covered in this episode and for additional information about my guest. Also, I'd love to engage you there to hear your opinions. How'd you feel about what you heard? Did you learn anything or were you inspired to act in any new way? Or do you have something to add that would let us know what you know? This is a go-to place for people to grab cups of consciousness and fire away. And you want to travel with her And you want to travel blind And you know you can trust her For she's touched your perfect body with her mind